Hi, Camera family. I trust all of you are doing well in spite of all the changes we've experienced over the course of this past week. Although I'm looking forward to my return to Kama, I wanted to provide you some encouraging words through this online platform until I can return. I've entitled today's message, How to Get Through What We Are Going Through. As you probably are aware and can see on the windows and the doors of Kama, health officials and our staff continue to offer common sense steps to contain, reduce, and prevent new infections of the coronavirus. But what should be our spiritual response to this pandemic? How can our hope in Christ remain firm as we walk through this dark valley? First of all, I want to remind each and every one of you that God is always with you. And I want you to continue to keep focused on what is unchanging, which is God himself. And that God desires to continue to use you as you minister to others, even in the midst of this crisis. We already know in advance that this virus will not last. It's a valley that we all must walk through. And we're going to walk through it together. As usual, my friends, my motto at CAMA is, we are family. Let's turn our attention to God's Word, the Bible. And I want us to just pick out a verse out of the book of Job that is found in chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, Job stood up, tore his robe in grief, shaved his head, and then fell to the ground and worshipped. Hmm. I want you to go to your memory banks right now, and I want you to think back to when you were a kid. I know for some of us, that was a really long time ago. But in your childhood, did you ever say the following words? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I hope I'm not the only one that said those. But as I've grown up out of childhood, I know for a fact that that statement is simply not true. You know, each one of us has been wounded by words that have been said to us. Words said in anger. Words said when we've been misunderstood. We've also been wounded by many other things. And when life wounds are deep, it is really hard to know how to heal from them. As we read about Job in the Bible, though, I want to read the first, first chap chapter in the, the book of the Bible where it says Job was blameless and he was upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Job had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. On top of all that, he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. You know, from this passage, we see that Job was wise. He was a good man. And from all that he had obtained to, in his life to this point, he was very wealthy. He was a husband. And he was a father to 10 kids. But you know, one day as we read throughout the book of Job, 
One day he'd lost almost everything. He lost his entire wealth. He lost all 10 of those kids. And then to top it all off, he lost his health to a very painful disease. From what I just described, I'm sure you would agree with me that Job was wounded in virtually every way you can be wounded. Yet he chose to worship God instead of become bitter. And if you haven't had the opportunity to read the entire story of Job in the book of Job, in the end, here's the spoiler alert. God restores Job and even double all that he lost. In Job 36, 15 to 16, it says this, hard times and trouble are God's way of getting our attention. And at this very moment, God deeply desires to lead you from trouble and to spread your table with your favorite food. You see, my friends, whenever we are wounded, God, like in Job's story, is waiting to turn our situations around. He wants to help grow us through those trying times. And he truly does desire to bless us. And as we see through the life of Job, the most important time for us to worship God is when our heart is breaking. Your darkest hour is when you need him most. It's in those difficult times where you see no end in sight that you can turn to God and invite him to help you. But first, the first way we can worship when we're wounded is to grieve. What do I mean by that, Charlene? Well, that means to tell God exactly how you're feeling in the moment. Because trusting God with your feelings is an act of worship. That's what Job did, as we already read in chapter 1, verse 20. Job stood up, he tore his robes in grief, he shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground and worshipped. My friends, God didn't make our bodies to swallow all the negative emotions, all the negative circumstances that we've experienced over the course of our lifetime. Because you know what? If you do choose to do it that way, one day you're going to be like a bottle of pop that's been shaken vigorously, you're going to explode. So I want to challenge you, my friends. Instead of suppressing your emotions, I want you to express those emotions to God. He's not afraid of them. In fact, God has emotions too. The Bible talks about God feeling love, how he feels anger, jealousy, and yes, my friends, even grief. Trust me when I tell you this. God can handle your feelings. In fact, you would be surprised to know that not only can he handle your feelings, but it says in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15, that the battle is not yours, but God's. You know, when I was reading these verses in preparing for today's message, it brought to my mind a time in my life when I was much younger, where I worked as a lifeguard at a Christian camp called Camp Kakwa in Hope, British Columbia. And I gotta tell you, any lifeguard would share this piece of advice. You cannot save anyone as long as they are trying to save themselves. Because if you try to save them in that moment, 
the person's just going to pull you down too, and you'll both drown. So what you need to do in those circumstances is that you must tread water until that person finally gives up. And then actually the rescue efforts are pretty easy. All you got to do is put your hand over their shoulder and you swim back to shore. And I was thinking about this story and I was thinking about uh, that time in my life. And it's the same with our relationship with God. When we try to fight through life's troubles, through the emotions that we experience of anger, frustration, hostility, anxiety, when we try to fight those on our own, we sink. In fact, I think God's wanting to tell each and every one of us today to stop fighting our own battles and to be obedient by trusting him and inviting him to do the work on our behalf. You know, God taught Israel's army that same lesson. Let me give you a little bit of a background. There were three enemy armies that were preparing to battle against Israel's army. Now you and I are not mathematicians, but we do know three against one. It's pretty obvious that we could say Israel was far outnumbered. But instead of worrying about what the king was seeing in front of him with three armies against one. King Jehoshaphat led his army to worship God by depending on him to save them, not through their resources or their weapons, but through God alone. In fact, it says in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 12, it says, King Jehoshaphat said this, we do not know what to do. We are begging for your help. And then the next verse, God answers that prayer. And he says this, Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army in front of you. For the battle's not yours, but God's. And I was thinking about that in light of all that we've experienced over the course of this week. God wants the same thing from each and every one of us. He wants us to stop trying to fight our own battles and let him fight them for us. You know, the story in 2 Chronicles continues in verse 17. It says, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. The same verse, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was reading this passage, as I prepared for this message, I thought to myself, are not those the strangest orders you could give an army? Here God doesn't tell us to stay home. I'll take care of it. He actually tells Israel to go out to the battlefield. Except, I don't want you to fight. Hmm. That would be pretty scary. But it would also be putting my money where my mouth is, wouldn't you think? He's asking the army of Israel to trust him in what he says. I got this. You do your part, let me do mine and watch and see what I can do. And you know, that's exactly what Israel's army did. And whatever each one of us is experiencing today, I believe that that's what God is asking from us as well. He's asking us to stand strong in quiet confidence in him. He's asking us not to be afraid or discouraged. And I don't know about you, if any of you remember raising your kids, 
The one thing that I know is we can never run from our worries, our concerns, or the problems that face us. And we all know why. Because they never get better if we do. And like the army of Israel, God wants us to face our difficult situations. Yet he's inviting us to trust him to deliver us from them. So here's my challenge, my friends. Your homework, like you always get when I talk to you. Whatever emotions you're feeling or concerns you are battling with today, trust God to win the battle for you. Regardless of your circumstances, you can hold tightly to the hope we find in Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul reminds us of God's promise to us in Romans 5 5 let me just grab that for us hold on Romans 5 5 says this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us my friends although you may be experiencing feelings of abandonment maybe some anger, isolation from your family and friends, let me remind you that you are still loved by all of them. And you are deeply loved by the amazing staff that's around you today. And most of all, you are loved by God himself. Through the salvation that he has provided through his son, Jesus Christ, through your inheritance as being heirs with Christ, and ultimately the love of our good and heavenly Father. My friends, may you soak in the goodness of these truths, and would you rejoice in the mind-boggling reality that God intends nothing but good for us. You know, I know it's my custom to pray for each and every one of you after our services. I just want you to know I'm praying for you here at home. But my prayer I want to leave you before I close is for both of us. That together as family, we will gain a greater understanding of the significance of these truths as we continue to journey through God's word, through our times of praying together, and through doing life together at Kama. God bless you, my friends. And I look forward to seeing you face-to-face -face in person real soon. God bless.